Amen. All right, we're here in Genesis chapter number 14. We're going to begin reading in verse number 1. Genesis chapter 14, verse 1. And it came to pass in the days of Amraphel, king of Shinar, Ariok, king of Elasar, Kedar Laomer, king of Elam, and Tidal, king of nations, that these made war. These is referring, obviously, to those kingdoms and kings that were mentioned in verse 1. That these made war with Bera, king of Sodom, and with Beersheba, king of Gomorrah. So those are the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah. These are two separate cities, cities that are nearby one another, sister cities, if you will. Bera, king of Sodom, and with Beersheba, king of Gomorrah, Shinab, king of Adma, and Shemeba, and Shemeber, king of Zeboiim, and the king of Bela, which is Zoar. <clears throat> All these were joined together in the vale of Siddim, which is the salt sea. Now, verse 3 says, all these were joined together. That is referring to verses 1 and verses 2. They are battling against one another. The kings or kingdoms that are mentioned in verse 1 are battling the kings or kingdoms that are mentioned in verse 2. <clears throat> verse 4. Twelve years they served Kedor Laomer. That's referring to the kings and kingdoms of verse 2. Twelve years they served Kedor Laomer, and in the thirteenth year they rebelled. And in the fourteenth year came Kedor Laomer and the kings that were with him and smote the Rephams in Ashtaroth, Karnaim and the Zuzims in Ham, and the Enid Emims in Shavi, or Shavi, Kiriathium, 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 sorry, Kiriathium, and the Horites in their Mount Seir. Unto El Paran, which is by the wilderness. Verse 7. And they returned and came to En Mishpat, which is Kadesh, and smote all the country of the Malachites and also the Amorites that dwelt in, Hez in Hazaz, Zona Tamar. Now, the kingdoms or the kings listed again in verse 1, they are battling or fighting against the kings and kingdoms that are mentioned. In verse 5, at first, or in the beginning. Once they smite them, once they destroy them, if you will, they end up leaving there, also mentioned in verse 6, and it says, and they returned. So this obviously implies that they are going back to their own kingdom. They are going back to the land of their nativity where they dwell. So they are returning, but on their way back, it says, it says, and came to, and then it lists off, uh, you know, other nations or other kingdoms that they began to go to war with also. So now they are fighting a totally different group of people. They conquered the first group of people. Now they're fighting uh, against and smiting, if you will, another group of people. Then pick up there again in verse 8. It says, and there went out the king of Sodom and the king of Gomorrah. So they are not currently a part of this secondary phase, the second battle of this war, if you will. There's two battles that took place. And this, there's this second battle that looks like the king of Sodom and Gomorrah and all the other kings that were also listed in verse 2. They were not yet a part of this. But it says they had earlier rebelled. So a couple of years before this, they rebelled. So this is their opportunity to go in and to become confederate or to become a, you know, an ally with another group of people. And maybe they can conquer these kings, the king of Kedor Laomer specifically, which ruled over them. So that's, I'm sure, why they are joining in. It says, and there went out the king of Sodom and the king of Gomorrah, we're in verse 8, and the king of Adma and the king of Zeboiim and the king of Bela. And then it tells you what Bela is, the same as Zoar, and that's what's normally used throughout the Bible. <clears throat> and they join battle with them in the Vale of Siddim. The Vale is, uh, the other word that is used synonymously with Vale in the Bible is Dale. It's D-A-L-E. Dale and Vale mean the same thing, but, you know, if you relate the word Vale to Valley, much easier to remember what both of those so if you start with Vale, it's the same as Dale. Vale is just a valley. A Dale is just a valley. That's all that's referring to. There's a valley is what that means. The Vale of Siddam. The Valley of Siddam. <clears throat> Look at verse 9. With Kedor Laomer, the king of Elam. So they went out to battle against him. Those groups of kings the rebel that rebelled against them earlier. And with Tidal, king of nations, and Amraphel, king of Shinar, and Ariok, king of Elasar, four kings with five. So if you look there in verse 9, the four kings are the ones that are rebelling. 
the, the, or I'm sorry, the four kings are the ones that are the rulers. They are the ones that actually uh, are being rebelled against, right? Then the five kings are those that are a part of the rebellion, that, can, that were the confederates. <clears throat> Look at verse 10. And the vale of Siddam, this is the valley, remember what that means, was full of slime pits. Slime is like tar. This is, you know, there's pockets of tar people uncover all the time, especially in that specific area that's very common over near like Mediterranean, Mesopotamia, like Africa. There's tar everywhere. So you see slime in the Bible, it's usually referring to what we would call tar. So it says, it was full of slime pits, and the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled and fell there. When the Bible says that someone fell, they fell there. It's saying they were defeated. They're losing. Not all of them died, though, because if you look at the rest of verse 10, it says, And they that remained fled to the mountains. So notice when it says, they that remained, saying those that didn't fall. Fell means to, to be defeated. It means to die. So it says, And they that remained fled to the mountain. They're going there for coverage. People do that oftentimes in the Bible. They'll go there for refuge. Verse 11, And they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all, the, and all their victuals and went their way. So once they left, they ran away, they basically raided their camps and they took all of their possessions, all of their goods, and the Bible says all their victuals. That's normally referring to sustenance, things that keep you alive. It's not just like, you know, uh, you know nice garments or clothing. Victuals are things that are uh, uh, essentials, things that like drinks, food. That's what victuals are oftentimes in the Bible. And it says, and went their way, verse 12, and they took Lot, Abram's brother's Son. If you remember, Lot was the son of Nahor. Lot is the son of Nahor, Abram's brother. Nahor was Abram, Abram's brother. So remember, Lot was dwelling in Sodom. So notice, Lot's now new allegiance with Sodom goes to the point where he's willing to go out and fight for the nation of Sodom. I don't know if that has crossed your mind before, but what, are, what is the nation of Sodom and Gomorrah doing here? They're battling. Why would Sodom be there at this point? He's fighting. Notice... It's, you know, they may have raided the, camp, the, the, the town, but that's not mentioned here. They may have actually went into the town because everyone had left, but that would be, you know, you would be imposing that upon the scripture. That's not mentioned. It just says that here it says, and they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and their victuals and went their way. That implies to me, because it's following the verse, verse 10, and they that remained fled to the mountain. That implies to me that they fled, they ran away, and what did they do? They left their camps behind. And then they go in there and they raid their camps. This is actually, this actually takes place other times in the Bible. You remember the leprous men? What do they do? God causes you know, them to have a rumor that there's a war. Uh, the Syrians, I believe, they flee and they, they, they run away. <coughs> Excuse me. And then what do the leprous men do? They go into the camp and they take things from the camp, don't they? So that would actually line up with other examples in Scripture. And plus, the only thing that is mentioned here is the location that where they are, the region of the slime pits. And then it specifically tells you that they leave. So what makes the most sense is that Lot is actually fighting on behalf of Sodom and Gomorrah here. And that's why he's captured. He was, you know, a, uh, a prisoner of war. <clears throat> and they took Lot, we'll reread verse 12. And they took Lot, Abram's brother's son... Who dwelt in Sodom and his goods and departed. Verse 13. And there came one that had escaped and told Abram the Hebrew, for he dwelt in the plain of Mamre, the Amorite, brother of Eshcol, and the brother of Anan. And these were confederate with Abram. Now, Hebrew, that's the first time that the word Hebrew is used in the Bible. And that a Hebrew is someone that is of Eber. I don't know if you remember that, but if we go back to Genesis chapter number 9, I believe. I'm sorry, Genesis chapter 10, we see that genealogy of Shem, and then from Shem ultimately came Eber, and that's where we get the name or, uh, or the title of a Hebrew. That's what that's coming from, is from Eber. He is a Hebrew, Abram that is, because he is of the line of Eber. <clears throat> so that's the first time that that word is actually mentioned in the Bible. So Ab Abram receives word that Lot has been stolen. Right? Lot has been taken or kidnapped. And then it tells you he dwelt in the plain of Mamre, the Amorite. We saw that at the very end of chapter 13. There in verse 18, it told you when him and when Lot and, and, and uh, Abram actually split up, it tells you Abram went to Mamre when he went and when Lot went and pitched his tent towards Sodom. 
It tells you here also, it says that where he is, he is dwelling, Mam, <coughs> excuse me, Mamre, which is an Amorite, tells you, Mamre the Amorite, brother of Eshcol, and brother of Aner, it says, and these were confederate with Abram. So he's dwelling in Mamre, it's named after the man, Mamre, he's still living there, and Mamre, and then his two brothers, the bro it says the brother of Eshcol and the brother of Aner, and these, so who we just mentioned, Mamre, Eshcol, and Aner, these were confederate with Abram. So these three men went and they allied with Abram to go and to get back the possessions, to go and to get back the people. You know, I don't know what uh, specifically, because it's not mentioned what Mamre and those other two men actually went to recover. Very possible that maybe uh, they had relatives or things that were stolen from them as well. But they went back to get things back or whatever. Maybe they're just helping Abram. That's possible. But they're going, Abram is going to retrieve back Lot. He's going to go and he's going to try to break in and take Lot back. Right? He's been captured. Look at verse 14. And when Abram heard that his brother was taken captive... <clears throat> He armed his trained servants. You notice what, what it just referred to Lot as? His brother, right? So we have to be real careful with, you know, some of the language that's used in the Bible because the Bible speaks in a way that we don't always talk, right? The Bible, another example of this is, uh, is the relationship between Saul and David. <clears throat> what was the relationship between King Saul and then, you know, his successor, David? What was the relationship? What would we say specifically? Father-in-law and son-in-law, right? Would we, have, would we, you know, not very often, some, some, you know, the majority would not refer to their father-in-law as their father. The majority would not refer to their son-in-law as their son. Some people do that. There's nothing wrong with that at all. But the majority of people do not, right? So sometimes we can, you know, uh, we can reflect our terminology upon the Bible, but the Bible does not always use the same terms that we use, especially to re express relationships. Saul refers to David as his son. He will just say, my son. He calls him one time, my son, when he is his son-in-law. So that's good to take note of. Right here we see uh, Lot being Abram's nephew, right? That would be the relationship they had. It says that he is Abram, it, that Lot is Abram's brother's son. And you notice what, what actually the Holy Spirit says in verse 14. And when Abram heard that his brother was taken captive. So it's his nephew, but what does the Holy Spirit say that the relationship is between the two? <clears throat> his brother, right? So take note of that. Look, uh, we'll keep reading. <clears throat> Following that, the latter portion, he, he armed his trained servants born in his own house, 318, and pursued them unto Dan. So <clears throat> it says that Abram armed his trained servants, <clears throat> born in his own house, 318, and pursued them on day. Oftentimes, we don't only picture Abram. We, we picture Abram, Sarai, you know, maybe a couple other people, Ishmael, you know, and then we have uh, uh, Isaac, of course, and then maybe, you know, you think of H Hagar being there, don't you? But do you think of... 318 people that are there dwelling with him as well. Is that normally what you picture? <clears throat> Not only that, there's more than that because this is 318 of his trained servants, number one. So do you think that every single one of his servants are trained? No, because it wouldn't say 318 of his trained servants. You understand what I'm saying? Number one, and you never have, everyone is, is, is never. You have skilled laborers and you have just you know, uh, people that do more of the you know, menial tasks. Always, you have to have people that are the grunts, right? So 318 of them are trained. And then it says, trained servants born in his own house. It says 300, yeah, 318, it says, and pursued them unto dance. So what are they pursued? Or what are they trained in? They're obviously trained in war because it says that he armed, <clears throat> notice the wording, he armed his trained servants. So these are men that are trained for war. They are trained in fight and obviously trained with whatever weapon they're being armed with. So these are not just regular, you know, workers or servants that work for him. These are armed men. And as I said, we don't always picture the life of Abram in the way in which the Bible describes it, that he has hundreds of servants. 
He is running a huge operation. So when we see the Bible you know, uh, detailing the story and the controversy that took place with Lot and Abram, it makes a lot more sense when you start seeing the actual numbers of how many people. These are just his servants. So if you have, if you have one man per uh, sheep or one man per goat, no. You have hundreds, some, you know, sometimes, I don't know exactly how it works, you know, but maybe, maybe even thousands if they have them fenced in properly and you have them, you know, uh, actually corralled the right way, you could probably have thousands of goats and one man overseeing this field, right? So if he has hundreds of men, I mean, how much sheep does he have? How much, how much all of his cattle, how much does he have? I mean, he's a very, very wealthy man. The Bible talks about him having great goods, great possessions. I mean, he is not just, it's not just him, Sarai, like four or five other people. No, he has many, many people working for him, hundreds of people working for him. These are his trained servants. Normally, you have less trained servants, less people that are skilled than you do that are skilled. <clears throat> when you look at a job, you know, and you have like a crew, for example, normally you have a couple of guys like in my field that are technicians. And then the majority of the people that are on the crew would be what's considered a helper. There's, you know, if there's six, seven guys on a crew that's putting a roof on, right? You're going to have two guys that are using a nail gun. And then you're going to have the other guys carrying the shingles up, sliding the shingles to them, nailing the tar paper down, right? The majority of the people normally are not the skilled laborers. The majority of the people normally are not the ones that are trained and that are skilled and know what they're doing. So it makes sense that he probably has around 900 workers, you know, 600 workers. And that would be two-thirds, you know, of them would not be the skilled worker. And I'm just speculating, of course, but that's what would make sense. Two-thirds would not be skilled workers, would not be trained. And then the one-third would be the trained servants. These are the people that are specialized in certain areas. These are people that are prepared and ready to go to war. They know how to use this weapon. <clears throat> it could be half of that, or it may be just like another 100. But... Whatever we know, we know from looking at this that not all of them are trained. There would be no reason to say his, his trained servants if all of them knew how to use a weapon. That wouldn't make sense. So they pursued them unto Dan. So also another thing that's interesting is the end of verse 14. Do you notice what it said there? Where did they pursue them unto? Dan. Did, was Dan even born yet? He was not. I can tell that not everybody no, even noticed that for a second. He was not even born yet. Who wrote the book of Genesis? Moses. Moses wrote the book of Genesis. So he is, he is, I mentioned this last week, he is writing to an audience that's going to be reading this, these scriptures after the fact, right? So he's telling them what property this was, isn't he? So that when they see Dan, all they know what that is. It wasn't referred to or called Dan at the time that this took place, right? But he's letting, letting the reader know, hey, you know when that happened? They pursued them unto Dan. That's an interesting thought. When you see that happen all throughout the book of Genesis, it's very interesting. And it's easy to read over, too, just because we're so familiar with just Dan, the 12 tribes, the locations and everything. Verse 15, and he divided himself against them, he and his servants, by night, and smote them and pursued them unto Hobah. So this is not... Abram's first rodeo, is it? You notice what he did? Like, he came in strategically. It says he divided himself against them, he and his servants by night. So he comes in, and he's breaking them into categories or breaking them into different groups. He's saying, okay, we need, like, I'm sure, I'm sure he's strategizing this. They end up defeating an army in just a moment we're going to read. So he's probably, he's probably splitting up and dividing all of his... You know, more, you know, uh, uh, the, the stronger uh, soldiers will probably split them up and divide them and disperse them out into these groups. How many did he has? Three, four, five groups? He probably, he's, you know, yeah, he probably knows the area well. He's saying, you flank them from this side. We're going to come in from the front. You guys way back. So I'm assuming that Abram knows what he's doing. I think that's a safe assumption, the fact that he goes in and they, de they actually defeat to some extent. I don't know how many people are left, but they defeat the armies that are there. Then it says, on, uh, at the end it says, which on the left hand, which is on the left hand of Damascus, referring to Hobah, verse 16. And he brought back all the goods. And also brought again his brother, Lot. Again, the Bible refers to Lot as his brother. And his goods, and the women also, and the people. Verse 17. 
And the king of Sodom went out to meet him after his return from the slaughter of Kedor Laomer. So the king of Sodom goes out to meet him after he won. It says, and of the kings that were with him at the valley of Sheba, which is the king's dale. Now that's again the king's valley or the king's dale or vale. Notice it was used interchangeable there. Uh, it says dale now as opposed to earlier it said the vale of Shittim. Uh, no, actually it wasn't Shittim, was it? That's a different vale. Siddim. Shittim is a type of wood. So that was a mis... I'm sorry about that. <clears throat> For the foul language up here behind the pulpit. Verse 17. It's uh, verse 18. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine. And he was the priest of the Most High God. Now this is very interesting. I'm going to read a couple of these verses and then we're going to take a look at this. Uh, before it was just kind of detailing, you know, uh, the account of the war. So we went through that pretty quick. But right here we're going to spend some time. We have some doctrine here that we can learn from referring to Melchizedek. So first we see that the king of Sodom shows up here in verse Number 17, king of so Sodom shows up. A lot of people overlook the fact that the kings that represented all the other kingdoms and nations, they're there as well. So it's all the kings that are representing all of those nations. They all show up, and it says they meet him, which is in the king's dale. And it says in verse 18 that somebody else shows up that's not related, that's not with them. And it, and it mentions him by name and says, and Melchizedek, now watch this, king of Salem. So notice these kings show up, but then it, it separately mentions this other king. It's a very, very interesting passage. The king of Salem. So notice he is a what? He's a king. Then it says this. It says that the king brought forth bread and wine. And then it also says this. And he was the priest of the most high God. Now number one, let me just ask you this question. Can you think of anybody in the Bible who is a king and a priest. Anybody. Not that difficult. But you know you only have one answer. I don't know if you noticed that as well. There is no one else that I can think of that I've ever noticed, and I've thought about this before, that is a king and a priest. I've also heard people say that the reason why King Saul was punished was because he tried to take the position of all three, king, priest, and prophet. You know, I don't know if you noticed that or not when that takes place. I've heard that preached a few different times by people in, in the uh, Independent Fundamental Baptist movement. I believe Jack Hiles preached that. And he tried to you know, usurp the authority of all three. Hey, you can be king. But then what does he do? He goes and he offers up the offering. He's trying to take the position of the priest as well. And what else does he do? You see him preaching, don't you? You see him and actually refers to him as Saul, also among the prophets. It's because there's only one man that is king, priest, and prophet. And who is that? That's the Lord Jesus Christ. So isn't that interesting right there when Melchizedek is mentioned? It says he's the king of Salem. He brought forth bread and wine. And it says that he was the priest of the Most High God. Now, where is Salem? Or what is Salem? It's Jerusalem, right? It doesn't spell that out for you, but it can easily be deduced. Now, what does, what does Salem mean? It tells you in the, what is it, in the following verse or is it in that verse itself? No, it was, oh, no, 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 it's in a completely different chapter. Go to Hebrews chapter number 7. Hebrews chapter number 7. I thought that that was mentioned here as well, but I'm wrong. Hebrews chapter number 7. Once you get there, get your hand there in Hebrews 7. Let's look at the Old Testament mention of this as well. Go to uh, Psalms, go to the book of Psalms. And it's Psalm 110 verse 4. Psalm 110 verse 4. <coughs> Psalm 110, that's verse 4. Let's look at that first. So, so Melchizedek is only mentioned here in Genesis 14 until you get to the book of Psalms. He's only mentioned in the book of Psalms one time, so he's only mentioned in the Old Testament twice, not mentioned again until you get to the New Testament. So that's very interesting because he's, he's obviously spoken of as being a very profound, you know, a reputable person, if you will. Now, those are obviously minor terms uh, to refer to the honor that this person really deserves. <clears throat> but look at Psalm chapter number 110. We're going to look at, I believe it's, did I say verse number 4? Yes, verse number 4. It says, The Lord hath sworn and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now, here in verse number 4, you're not told who Melchizedek is. 
You're not given the information specifically about Melchizedek. What you are given is a prophecy about the Christ saying that he is going to be a priest, as is mentioned there, forever after the order or just like the patterns it's going to look like, just like Melchizedek. Why? Saying that Melchizedek is a priest for all eternity. We're going to see that go over to Hebrews chapter number 7. <clears throat> we'll read down through here. Actually, go back to... Uh, I think it's Hebrews 5. <coughs> First, yeah, yeah. <coughs> it's Hebrews 5, 6. Hebrews chapter number 5. I want you to look at verse number 6. So here's, it's spoken of in the book of Hebrews. I don't have all the references for Hebrews, but I know it's mentioned here. I believe he's mentioned maybe in Hebrews chapter number 4 as well. We're going to skip that. I think it's at the end of Hebrews chapter 4. <coughs> yeah, he's mentioned, he's spoken of at the end of Hebrews chapter number 4. But I want to look here in Hebrews chapter number 5, this same high priest that is. <coughs> Hebrews chapter number 5, I want you to look at verse number, let's look at verse 5. We'll begin in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 5. So also Christ glorified not himself to be made an high priest. So in the same way, let's explain in context that Aaron did not ordain or appoint himself, neither did Christ, right? So also Christ glorified not himself to be made an high priest, but he that said unto him, so this is the one that appointed him or glorified him, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. Verse 6, as he saith also in another place, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So right here, the Bible tells us that Psalm 119, verse 4, was a prophecy about the Lord Jesus Christ saying that this prophecy was actually God appointing or ordaining, glorifying is the word that's used, him as the high priest. That God actually chose the Lord Jesus Christ to be the high priest. And the proof of that is Psalm 119 verse 4. So we actually see what Psalm 119 verse 4 is talking about in context in Hebrews chapter number 5 verse number 6. And it says that he is a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now at this point it can seem like Melchizedek is a different person, couldn't it? Because it says that he's after the order. He's like Melchizedek. But here's the thing. Melchizedek is an unidentified character of the Old Testament. We don't know who Melchizedek really is, do we? It's just saying, hey, he's after the order of Melchizedek. Does it explain yet how in, in, in detail, at least in what way? It says forever. So obviously it tells you, and we have the context, what we're getting ready to look at in Hebrews 7. That's why if anyone knows or understands that, you understand it from verse 7. But it's because he's going to be a priest forever or for all eternity. Now, in the Old Testament, was that clear? That that's the way in which he was going to be a priest after the order of Melchizedek? It says that he's going to be one forever. But it's not, you know, utterly clear. It's not extremely clear, especially just from reading Genesis 14. You just see Melchizedek show up. You don't know a lot of details about Melchizedek. He comes and then he goes. <laughs> So somebody could think or say that maybe Melchizedek is a different person than the Lord Jesus Christ. But I'm going to show you that Melchizedek was an Old Testament appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now look at verse 7. <clears throat> who, referring to the Christ here, Jesus, who in the days of his flesh, <clears throat> when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears, unto him that was able to save him from death, and was heard in that he... Fear. Now notice, there was fear in Christ. This would have been a good verse that I could have used um, in, the, uh, in the sermon that I preached about, you know, uh, what, was the, what was it entitled? Oh, the impeccability and impeccability of Christ. Notice, he, it, the Bible clearly says <clears throat> that he had cryings and he had tears. It says he offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears. I mean, that's very strong language. Like, he's in torments here, and it says, and was heard in that he feared. So it was a, and it was clear by reading the text that there was a, an aspect of fear. It wasn't there. It's very clear. What is, what is the whole reason why he's, he's asking if you can, you know, uh, take this cup from me? Nevertheless, not thy will, my, my will, but thine be done. What's the point? It's because he's getting ready to go through, through something, you know, atrocious, isn't it? So there's an aspect of fear that should make you even more so be thankful for your salvation of what he had to go. And he still said, I'm going to do it anyways. Amen. I mean, that should make you thankful. That should make you grateful. <clears throat> I just popped into my mind what 
follows this. It just popped in my mind. I want to, I want to say something about verse 8 because I don't think I've ever really focused on verse 8. It's about the Lord Jesus Christ that ties in with the, the, the Trinity controversy and, the, and, the, and a major hole, according to the Bible, with the Trinity. Now, this is just as plain as the nose is on your face. And I don't know if I've ever mentioned this before, but look at verse 8. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. So one of the, one of the, the points of, <coughs> one of the tenets of the Orthodox Trinity is that they are, there are three persons that are eternally co-eternal, eternal, eternally, you know, co-equal, right? <laughs> and they are eternally uh, um, all God. They're distinct, but they have different authority structures. And the people that, will, that are proponents of this, they don't believe that the authority structure just took place because Christ was on the earth as a man, do they? They'll say that he was eternally subject to Christ and will be eternally subject, or to God, I'm sorry, that Christ was eternally subject to God. The second person, the Lord Jesus Christ, is eternally subject to the first person, God the Father, in eternity past, in eternity future, all of that, don't they? Look at verse 8. <clears throat> Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. Now, I don't know if you see what this is teaching, but it's as clear as day. If he was eternally in subjection all throughout eternity past, there's no way he could learn obedience, moron. It's impossible. You could not learn obedience. He's always been obedient. He's always been in subjection. But when he came, he learned. No, learning something is something that you have not yet experienced. You could not have been, he could not have been eternally in subjection or eternally having to obey the first person of the, the, the Trinity. And then he comes and he's like, yeah, I just learned obedience. Father, that makes zero sense. He would have already have known what obedience is like. Right. It's so dumb. I'm losing my voice and this is something I have to yell about. It is aggravating. That verse right there is, it's done. It's game over, buddy. Bury it. That point of the Trinity is done for. All I need is that one verse. He could not have learned obedience if he was obedient prior to his life on this earth. You know what else it proves? That the son refers to the man. Right. Look again. Though he were a son. Though he were a son. Thought he was, you could refer to any point in his life. You could say that eternity passed. That wouldn't make sense. Though he were a son, notice what part of, notice, uh, um, you know, when, of Christ when this is referring to. Let me word it that way. Of Christ which, when this is referring to. His life on this earth. Right. What's the context? It's talking about him. Strong supplications and prayers. Or, I'm sorry, uh, uh, he prayed with prayer. I'm trying not to look at it. Prayers and, and supplications with strong crying and tears. What's it talking about? He's a man. Right. He's a son. Right. It's super clear. And as a son, though he were a son, referring to what? A specific time in which he was a son. Though he were a son, learned he obedience. Now, even further, let's put a further wrench in this. If he was a son prior to that, why would it say, though he were a son, learned he obedience? Notice that it pinpoints a specific time when he was a son, and then it says, when he was a son, he learned obedience. And when's it talking about? When he's on this earth as a man. <clears throat> he could not have been eternally in subjection prior to this and, and then have come to earth and then learned obedience. No, 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 that wouldn't make any sense. He would have already learned it prior to that in eternity past. That sounds so stupid in the first place. It doesn't even make sense. Amen. How could you learn something that you've eternally been doing? Goodness sakes. Right. Do people they make the Bible foolish, man. That is so dumb. How could you ever learn something that you're just eternally doing that? Does God learn things in heaven? Is there anything that, that God asked? Oh, wow, I never thought of that. While he's sitting upon his throne in heaven. But you know who did learn things? The, the man Christ Jesus grew in wisdom and grew in stature, the Bible says in Luke chapter number 2. Last verse of Luke 2. Second to last verse or last verse of Luke 2. So it makes perfect sense that 
And you know, what, you know what it tells you one chapter prior to that? It tells you what the Son of God, what it means to be the Son of God. One chapter. So read Luke 1, read the end of Luke 2, and then come to Hebrews 5, verse 6, 7, 8, and it makes perfect sense. And you know what it does? Just this one verse alone, totally, 100%, destroys the false teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ being in eternal subjection to the Father. It's false. Amen. It's false. It's game over. I don't need another verse. There are, there are times in the Bible where one verse is clear enough. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9 is clear enough to teach you that it's by grace through faith and not of works, isn't it? Amen. Well, guess what? Hebrews 5, verse 8 is clear enough to teach you and to tell you that Christ was not or could not have been eternally in subjection prior to this. That's what this teach, he taught, teaches. He learned obedience. While he was a son. What son? Referring to him becoming a man. You want me to further prove while he was a son? Look at, uh, look at the beginning of verse 7. Who in the days of his flesh. What's it saying there? It's repeating the same thing. Learn how to read the Bible. That tells me that people don't understand the language of the Bible. Who in the days of his flesh. And then it says, though he were a son. What's, what's it pointing you to? Son flesh. It's his flesh. It's the time. When did he learn obedience? Maybe, maybe he learned obedience when he was having to go through with all of this torment and sorrow and he prayed to his father. And what did he do? He went through it anyways, didn't he? It makes perfect sense. I mean, the Bible makes perfect sense when you really understand it. Because it was written by God. It's a perfect book. Go to Hebrews yeah. chapter 7. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 7 is where we find out actually who was Melchizedek and it was an appearance in the Old Testament of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what it was. <coughs> Look at Hebrews chapter 7, verse 1. For this Melchizedek... Michaela, give me some water. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the king and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, First being by interpretation king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace. Now that's what I was thinking of. And what is, uh, what is the, the, the one word that everybody knows in Hebrew? Shalom. shalom. That's what Salem comes from. What does shalom mean? Does anybody know? Peace, peace be with you. That's all that it means. It's, the same, it's, it's a variation of the word Salem. Like the end of Jerusalem is like shalom. Shalom. Right? That makes sense? So that's like how words will, you know, evolve over time. So king of Salem, and it tells you which is king of peace. See, you don't even have to read Hebrew, you know. The Bible is built in dictionary. Amen. Verse 3. Without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth a priest continually. Verse 4. Now consider how great this man was. We're talking about the man that appeared, and what was his name? Melchizedek. Specifically, I want you to pay close attention while we walk down through here, watch the antecedents, make sure that the subject does not change. <clears throat> now consider how great this man was, unto whom even the patriarch Abraham gave the tenth of the spoils. <clears throat> and verily, they that are of the sons of Levi who receive the office of the priesthood, have a commandment to take tithes of the people according to the law. So tithes are at, The word tithe means ten. So he gave a tenth of his spoil. He was giving a tithe is what that's saying. It's saying the same way that Abraham gave a tenth or a tithe to Melchizedek, all of the children of Israel are commanded to give them to the nation of Levi. <laughs> it says they have a commandment to take tithes of the people according to the law, that is, of their brethren. So of the children of Israel. Though they come out of the loins of Abraham. Saying the Levites do. <clears throat> Verse 6. But he whose descent is not counted from them received tithes of Abraham. So the them there. What's the them referring to? The Levites. It's saying <clears throat> he whose descent. That's Melchizedek. His descent is not of the same line as the Levites, is it? Saying he's not a Levite. So Melchizedek's 
Not a Levite is what it's saying. His descent is not the same of the Levites. But he whose descent is not counted from them received tithes of Abraham and blessed him that had the promises. So now it's explaining there's another guy who is not of the Levites that took tithes of Abraham. Verse 7, and without all contradiction, the less is blessed of the better. So what's that telling you right there? Melchizedek is a greater man than Abraham is what that's saying. So first they lift up the Levites saying, hey, the Levites received tithes of the people, didn't they? Well, this guy also received tithes of the people. That's what it's trying to illustrate for you. You see how special this guy is? Then, it, then he builds up the story even more so, and he says, well, you know what else? <clears throat> The, uh, you know, without contradiction, the less is blessed of the better, I believe, is the word that it uses, correct? The less is blessed of the better, right? So the lesser person gets blessed by the better person. So what's it telling you? That this man is even greater than Abraham. Look at verse 8. And here, men that die receive tithes, but there he received them. Now, real important. Who is the he that received them? We haven't changed subject. Who's he talking about? Melchizedek, right? <clears throat> so who are the men that die? The Levites. But there he received them. That is Melchizedek. And then look at verse 8. Of whom, the end there, of whom it is witnessed that he lived. Who, who is the person that's witnessed? Who are they going around and witnessing he lives? What are we singing a song? He lives, right? Who is he talking about? Right. Jesus. So you notice what it just did there? Who is the person that the tithes were given to? Christ. The person that we're going around and witnessing that he lives is the same person that the tithes were given to. He's the one that received the tithes. Further proof of that. Keep reading. And as I may so say, Levi also, who received the tithes, paid tithes in Abraham. So now he's going to illustrate the point even further that Levi, that this man is greater than Levi, right? So Levi receives the tithes, the tribe of Levi received the tithes of the children of Israel, but, but even Levi paid tithes to this man. <clears throat> and, as I, and as I may so say, Levi also who received tithes paid tithes in Abraham for me because he was yet in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. It might go off. So he's in the, he's in the loins of his father. He's not yet been born because Abraham was... You know, the father of the 12 tribes of Israel, ultimately, right? <clears throat> so he paid tithes through being in Abraham, through Abraham. By proxy, basically, he paid tithes to this man, saying this man's greater than Levi, he's greater than Abraham. That's the point, who the, the person of who these tithes were paid to. Look at verse 11. If therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law... What further need was there that another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek? Saying a man that was just like Melchizedek, right? And not be called after the order of Aaron. So if the Levites were the greatest, why would we need another priest to replace them? They would have just continued on if they were so great, right? We wouldn't need this other man to come that would be after the order of Melchizedek. <clears throat> Verse 12, for the priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity... A change also of the law. Verse 13. Pay close attention. For he of whom these things are spoken pertaineth to another tribe. Who are we talking about? Who are the things spoke, being spoken of? Melchizedek. And it says, for he of whom these things are spoken pertains to another tribe. What tribe is that? We're going to read it in the next verse. Judah. Notice that Melchizedek is of one of the tribes of Israel. How is that possible? Because he would have actually come, if you were to think about this, he would have actually have lived Melchizedek when Abraham is, lit, is, is on the earth. Well, Abraham's grandson is Jacob, who is Israel, right? And then he spawned the 12 tribes. So it's like this is, you know, three generations back. How is that possible? Well, it's because, you know, Jesus Christ is the Lord, of course. There's an Old Testament parents of the Lord. Look at, uh, let's look, we'll finish reading verse 13. For he of whom these things are spoken, referring, uh, referring to Melchizedek, pertaineth to another tribe of which no man gave attendance at the altar. Judah did not serve the altar, only the Levites did. Verse 14, <clears throat> this is further revealed. For it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah. 
of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning the priesthood. So, very, very clear. Two times, verse number 8 we see, and here, and here men that received, that, that die received tithes, that's the Levites, but there he receiveth them, Melchizedek receives them, of whom Melchizedek is witness that he lives. Jesus Christ is the one that is witness that he lives. Jesus Christ is Melchizedek. Further proof is verse 13 and 14. For he of whom these things are spoken, the whole context, all of this is speaking of Melchizedek. It says pertains to another tribe. If you say this was a literal person, it wasn't the Lord Jesus Christ, that makes no sense because he would have lived before the 12 tribes were even on this earth. And then it's further proven that it's talking about the tribes of Israel because right after that it says, of which no man gave attendance at the altar. So, when was the altar built? That's with Moses and all of them when they came out later, right? Then it even defines verse 13, 40, and it says, For it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah. So, notice it was talking about Melchizedek, but it was talking about our Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. This was an Old Testament appearance of our Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. Go back to Genesis chapter number 14. Keep reading down through here. One other thing that you may not have noticed that's very, very interesting in Genesis 14, go back to verse 17, it says, And the king of Sodom, no, I'm sorry, verse 18, and Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth wine, <clears throat> I'm sorry, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. So Melchizedek is the king of Jerusalem, he's a king and he's a priest. What does he bring? Bread and wine. What is that? It's a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ's death, isn't it? It's the Passover. It's the picture of the New Testament ordinance of the Lord's Supper. What do we do with the Lord's Supper? Bread and wine. It's amazing. The Bible is an amazing book. It's not a coincidence what he ends up bringing. And then we get to the New Testament. I love all those things in the Old Testament that maybe you don't notice right away. But then you get to the New Testament and the Holy Spirit reveals it unto you. Just like... <clears throat> Well, we're going to read about when uh, Abraham takes Isaac up to the mount. You don't notice the subtle statement that Abraham makes where he says, I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. He knew, even though God had told him to sacrifice Isaac, and I'm spoiling Genesis 22, he knew that God had told even though he had said to sacrifice Isaac, that he and Isaac both were going to be coming back down because he had already received the promise that through Isaac... They were going to have, you know, the, he was going to be, you know, a, a father of many nations, right? You could easily read over that, couldn't you? I didn't notice that. And I probably wouldn't believe you if you told me you noticed it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but it's like, I'm not, I wouldn't have noticed that. I, I could have read the Bible over scores and scores of times and I would not have noticed that. Well, you go back and you read it, it's real clear, isn't it? It's real obvious. I and the lab will go, get, we'll go yonder and worship and we'll, we'll return again to you. We'll, it, it's talking about him and Isaac when he's going there. Kill Isaac, you get in the New Testament, what's it tell you? you know, it, it points out his great faith and how he was actually believing in the Lord. But you wouldn't have noticed that. You read this stuff about Melchizedek, and when you go to the New Testament, it tells you, hey, that's Jesus. Then you come back, what do you notice? Man, this guy's a king. This guy's a priest. He's the king of Salem. It's Jerusalem. He's bringing bread and wine. It's amazing the light that the New Testament sheds on the Old Testament. This is what you need to take away from that. The New Testament needs to be the commentary on the Old Testament. We look at Old Testament scriptures in light of the New Testament. The Bible is so clear that there are greater revelations in the New Testament. The prophets of the Old Testament dreamed to look into things. They, they would have died, the Bible talked about, how they wanted to look into the things that the New Testament Christians have. There's greater revelations. There's things that they didn't understand. Look at the prophets or the apostles that followed Jesus. There's so much that they didn't know. Right when Jesus was there, but then what happened? Script, scores and scores of scriptures were written over that period of time. They have a greater understanding. You can see them writing scripture, God using them, and then having a greater understanding through that. The New Testament should be your commentary. You should look at the Old Testament in light of the New Testament. The New Testament uh, describes things of the Old Testament that may not be that clear. Just like we looked at Galatians chapter 3, verse 16, where it points out that it says seed singular. Would you have noticed that? <clears throat> Sure not. Seed singular. And Paul, again, points that out. Paul three times. The Bible talks about Paul having you know, uh, abundance of revelations that are given in him. There's a lot of great things that are found in Paul's writings. You know, He was the one that was obedient to the Lord. So it, it makes sense that if he's going to do the greatest works and stuff, then that's the person that God will reveal the most truth to. So also, you want to know a lot of the Bible? Be obedient to God. 
<clears throat> Look at uh, verse number 19. It says, And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. <clears throat> verse 20, And blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thy hand. And he gave him tithes of all. Verse 21, And the king of Sodom said unto Abram, Give me the persons and take the goods. To thyself. So now the king of Sodom is the one that speaks up. That's why a lot of people don't notice that the other kings are present as well during this. So he speaks up and he says to Abram, give me the person. So all the people, this guy must be a Trinitarian. Give me the person. They're just ashamed to work, use the word people is why it sounds retarded. That's why they say persons. But this guy says, give me the persons and take the goods to thyself. So he's saying, let me have all the people. And then you just take all the possessions and all the goods to you. This guy's, you know, worried about his city probably partially, number one. He's probably using these people as servants and slaves, but he wants the people, right? We know that he's not a good man. Let me, he has bad, I can tell you that he has some sort of bad, uh, 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 you know, intentions when he's saying, give me the persons and you keep all the goods. He's not trying to help Abram. Abram's the one that won the battle in the first place for him. And then he steps in like, hey. Split this half and half. It's like, what in the world? I'll tell you what you're taking, buddy, right? He's the one that brought forth the, the, the victory. Look at, uh, look at verse 22. And Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have lifted up my hand unto the Lord, the most high God, the possessor of heaven and earth. No, he's not ashamed. He speaks to this filthy king. And his response is immediately, he's like, hey, the king comes up. This guy's got power. People bow to this man, worship this man. And he's like, hey, you take the persons, or I'll take the persons, you take the goods to yourself. Abram responds, and Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have lift up my hand unto the Lord, the most high God, the possessor of heaven and earth. Does he sound like he's ashamed of God? Not even the slightest bit. Has some filthy, disgusting king. I'm sure this guy, I mean, all the men, old and young, surrounded the house, right? This guy, if he's... If the king is wicked, how much more? There's a proverb, I don't remember exactly how it goes, but if the king's wicked, the people are wicked also. So the reason why all the people are living the way that they are is because they have a bad example of a leader. I'm sure this guy's a freak and a weirdo too. Look at verse 23. That I will not take from a thread. So he swore to God, he says, that I will not take from a thread. So even a small thread, even to a shoe latchet. And then I will not take anything that is thine, lest thou shouldest say, I have made Abram rich. He like kind of reproves him here. Not necessarily a, repro a rebuke, but he's like, these are all things of Sodom and Gomorrah, right? He's like, give me the persons, you take the goods. These are the possessions of you know, Sodom and Gomorrah. If you remember, or Sodom at least. If you remember when God had the nation of Israel go into all of the cities and destroy them, what did he tell them? To, what, what else did he say to do most of the time? You know, a lot, oftentimes he'd say, burn everything, don't take anything. Like Achan, remember what Achan does? Achan goes in there and takes a Babylonian garment. He takes like, you know, I can't remember, but like some sort of uh, brick of gold or silver or something like along those lines. But what was he supposed to do? He wasn't supposed to take anything. Why? Because it's a filthy city. You don't want to take anything out of there. It's disgusting. It's dirty. What does Abram say? I don't want anything from you, man. I already swore to God that I'm not even taking a thread to a shoe latch from you. Why? What's the reason why? He, said, he says, before that too, I don't want anything that is mine. That kind of puts it more in perspective when it's worded like that. I don't want anything that is yours. If you had it, I don't want it. Why? It's just a bad person. It's like taking dirty money from somebody, right? You don't know what they're doing with these things. You don't know how this was made, where they got it. You don't, you don't want to take part in that in any possible way. It's the same reason why you don't want to give some, you know, hobo 10 bucks, isn't it? Why? Because I don't, I don't want to take part in your dirty deeds. I don't want to give you this 10 bucks and you go get drunk tonight because I know that's what you're going to do with it, right? That's why. I don't want any, I don't want to take part, I don't want anything with me, you, not happening, buddy. You know what I mean? Not happening. That's why. Right. And that's how we should be with other, you know, situations like this. I gave you the example, obviously, of, you know, a homeless man or something like that. I don't give money to homeless people. If some guy, if I can tell he's super hungry, give him food. He's, like, going to die. You know, give this guy food in that case, right? But here's the, because you never, here's the, you don't know for a fact what type of situation he's going to 
You don't know for a fact. There are a lot of people that are out on the streets that are like, that are like handicapped. You start talking to these people, you realize like you are not meant. And it could be maybe they burned out their, their brain cells with drugs. Some of them, you know, really are. And some people like have these like, you know, extravagant ways that they like hide their legs and stuff like that. But some people really are handicapped. They can't walk. They would have a very hard time. Maybe they had a hard life and they have a very hard time getting a job. Somebody's starving or something like that. I would give them food. Some guy's like an able-bodied man. Don't give that guy a dime. If he can get a job, he needs to go work. You know, don't give him a dime. Amen. But here, I don't want to take part in some wicked person's, possibly some wicked person's deeds. I don't want anything that theirs. I don't want them to have anything that's mine. That's what you learn from that. You know, have your mind made up. Did Abram make this? That's one other point. Did Abraham or Abram make this decision on, on the spot? He said, before I even came here, I vowed to the God of heaven that I'm not taking anything that's yours. So he already knew what was going to happen or what was possible. And he knew we went. It's a, it, that's what happens all throughout history, all throughout the Bible. When people battle and one nation conquers another nation, what do they do? They take the, the spoils thereof, don't they? Well, Abram knows that. But he already decided, well, I go in there and we destroy them and we win. I'm not taking anything from Sodom. Why? Because this guy is filthy, he's dirty, he's disgusting. We already read in Genesis 13. What are the people? They, they were already bad. It says the center, you know, the, the people of Sodom were sinners. They were wicked before the Lord exceedingly, weren't they? So he already knew these people are dirty, they're nasty. I want nothing to do with them. I don't want to have anything to do with them. And I swore to God that I don't want anything that's yours. And that's the attitude that we should have. <clears throat> Look at, uh, look at the very end. He says this. Also, another point of that. Lest thou should say, I have made Abram rich. Lest he would say, oh, I made you rich. I made you what you are today. Look at verse 24. Save only that which the young man have eaten and the portion of the man which went with me. Aner, Eshcol, and Mamre. Those were the three men, remember, because he lives in the land of Mamre. And then it says, Mamre's brothers are Eshcol and Aner, and it says these three were confederate with Abram, right? Or later to be known as Abraham. And he says, let them take their portion. But Abram says, personally, this is the decision I made. They want to take something, whatever, so I'm in, but I don't want anything that's yours, right? I don't want anything that's yours. Let me say this, ending, the ending point here. <clears throat> so some people can say, well, Lot didn't know any better. Lot you know, had no idea that he shouldn't have went to Sodom. He shouldn't have went to uh, Gomorrah. He shouldn't have pitched his tent towards Sodom and Gomorrah. Did Abram know? Was Abram aware of the wickedness of the city? Abram was aware, wasn't he? Because you see him saying, I don't want anything of yours. What would have been the reason why he's saying, I don't want anything that's thine? He said he swore that he didn't want anything of his. I believe that that's him saying, because he knows. Why would he just say that? I swore to the God of heaven that I'm not taking a thread of shoe latchet of thine. You know, and then he also says at the end, lest thou shouldst say, Abram, I thought I made Abram rich. So I believe that at least at one point, Lot was aware of what he was doing. Obviously, here's the thing. Lot's a grown man. He's not an idiot in the first place. But he, he still had Abram's example where Abram was not going to go to Sodom. Abram was not going to go to Gomorrah. Right? He wasn't going to go to these cities. So What? You still have the person, even if you have a good example of someone in your life, even if you have a good father, even if you grow up and you have a good mother teaching you the Bible, you have a man like Abram, maybe who's your uncle, and he's showing you the Bible, he's teaching you things, you still have your own personal responsibility. Even if you see Abram says, I don't want anything to do with that, where's Lot go? He goes back to Sodom. He's taken out of there. He's standing here with Abram. And Abram tells the king of Sodom, I swore I don't want anything that's yours. And then Lot still what? Comes back and moves back to Sodom and Lord, doesn't he? He has his own, he has, he, has, he has to, every man, you know, has to stand by his own decisions. And that's what took place with Lot. So you need to, you have good examples in here. All the children have good examples of their parents. But there comes a time when you have to make your own decisions and you become responsible for those decisions. You know, your parents might do right. Your parents might go to church. Your parents might be Christians, right? You know, your parents might be saved, but there comes a time when your kids have to get saved. 
There comes a time when your kids have to decide when they're not living with you anymore, I need to go to church. It's Sunday. You know, hopefully you take your kids to church Sunday morning, Sunday evening, Wednesday night, and then they just wake up Sunday morning and they don't even think about it. They just start putting their tie on and getting ready. And I mean, wouldn't that be great? Wouldn't that be a great testimony? I don't even want my kids to even think about, oh, maybe I'll sleep in today. Right. They'll just know, hey, you know what I did when I was with Abram? You know, he went to church, so I'm going to go to church, right? But that's the point is it still comes down. They still have to make the choice. You, you need to set, number one, you need to set the best possible example that you can. Because they, you, you kids still have free will. They grow up and they decide what they're going to do. Imagine if you don't set a good example, how much harder it's going to be for them. Imagine if you do stop going to church. Imagine if you just stop going to church at all. Are they going to be more likely or less likely to go to church? Set the greatest example for your kids that you can. Set the greatest example for all your children or anyone that looks up to you that you can. Just so that you can help them that much more when it does come time to make their own personal decision. And hopefully they don't do the things like Lot did. Let's fire heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you, dear Lord, for your word. <coughs> thank you for everything you've done for us, dear God. We ask you that you would... Uh, uh, bless our church and be with it, dear Lord. Be with all the people here. Help us to continually love your Bible, love your word, and, and, and love our Bibles and, and learn from it, dear God, and, and study it. And not only uh, desire to, to learn from it and to study it while we're at Bible study, but to help us bleed over into our everyday lives. And help us also to take personal responsibility for all of our decisions. And in Jesus Christ's name, amen. amen.